only to discover that the person they are talking about is right there in the room listening. A great deal of our ability to communicate and interact with people is based on what we can see. If someone is working without the visual channel, the quality of communication back and forth with them is going to be severely hampered. Video conferencing capabilities are inexpensive and readily available, but just because the capabilities exist doesn't mean that teams use them effectively. The way many organizations try to use video conferencing is to schedule it for meetings. Basically, they're replacing the phone bridge with a video bridge. This can be useful. If you're working from home and join a meeting, it's infinitely better to be able to see the people you're talking to. If you are losing their attention, you can tell. If the person you're talking to gets up and leaves the room, you aren't oblivious. If you want to talk about Bob's body odor, you may temper what you say because he's sitting right there looking at you across the video conference. But face-to-face -face communication goes way beyond simply having meetings on video. A large percentage of the information flowing back and forth between team members happens outside of scheduled meetings. This is particularly true with Agile teams because they should be working hard to minimize meetings. That is why the organization invested in team rooms in the first place. Simply doing a 15-minute daily face-to-face -face meeting on video isn't going to replicate being in the office. The Agile teams I've worked with that have the most effective communication with remote team members have always on persistent video. Their virtual team room is just that, the virtual room where everyone joins and works on video where they can see and be seen. If there are physical team rooms with multiple people working in them, those rooms get connected to the virtual room with video units that offer good audio and video coverage of the room. They connect first thing in the morning and stay up all day. The value of this type of setup isn't immediately apparent, especially if you see software development as a bunch of solo activities performed by individuals that just happen to be grouped together in a team. However, if you see software development as a collaborative effort, working this way quickly shows its value. If Bob comments to Sue that he's having trouble getting to the development server, Chris can overhear and mention that it's being rebooted and he should try again in a few minutes. This is what would happen if everyone were physically in the office. But with an always-on virtual team room, it can happen regardless of who is located where. This type of communication is exactly why teams started trying to work together in team rooms in the first place. And there's no reason remote people shouldn't be able to participate the same as if they were there in person. I hear some people say that with instant messaging, they don't need persistent video because they can just text each other. Now, I'm all for giving teams good instant messaging tools. It gives you an option for asynchronous communication. If Alice sees on a video that Bob looks like he's really heads down on a problem, on a call, or having conversation, she may send an instant message for him to respond to when he is busy. Even when talking in the same room, teams are constantly using instant messaging to share URLs, IP addresses, code snippets, and funny pictures of cows, etc. But as powerful as instant messaging is, the Agile principles say that it should always be supplemental to the best way teams communicate, face-to-face. -face. If we want to be driven by the Agile principles, we need to leverage our technology to enable face-to-face -face interactions, even when dealing with distributed teams. Okay, we'll get started here in about five minutes.
Okay, thank you uh, <clears throat> for coming today. I've had one of those days where everything that worked perfectly in testing starts going wrong uh, when you're doing it live. Well, that was a uh, that was today for me. Um, lots of interesting things. Okay, so I'm going to throw a link there in the um, in the chat. Uh, you can join that to um, take a look at uh, it as as we uh, we'll have some interactive things as as we go. Uh, just to mention what's coming up next week, we've got Phil Ledgerwood is going to be joining us to talk about retrospectives that work. I'm really looking forward to this one. It should be interesting. And then the week after that, we're going to be talking about what is behavior driven development. We'll look at um, videos of robots chasing my young children around and uh, uh, look at how we can define the behavior of horrible insects uh, using BDD, but really just give a good overview of here's what behavior-driven development is, here's how you would use it. So if you're, um, if you or anyone on your team is interested, like what is this, how would it look to, to use it in, on our teams, this will be a great introduction to just kind of bring all the aspects and how they, they work together. So I encourage you to, to come to that and pass it on if you know anybody that's interested. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about um, remote agile. And so I've got a question for you. What's a brief embarrassing experience you've had in a work from home environment? Obviously keep it safe from, for work, but what's an experience you've had for work from home environment um, that maybe didn't go quite as well as, as planned? Uh, question, do you record these sessions? This shows their site where we can go and review the sessions we've missed. Yes, if you go to agilelnl, youtube.com slash agilelnl, I'm trying to start posting all of those there. Um, also, if you go to the events.zeric.net site, um, there's, a, there's a list of past events there and has some links. But most of them are, the, the YouTube site's probably the best place. Can't find it, email me and I will make sure we get you a link to it. Barking dog is probably the worst. Okay, well, I hope my dog doesn't start, start barking here. Um, miscellaneous background noises, okay. Not being muted when you thought you were muted, repeat offender, including this morning. Yes, I've done that. Thinking I was on mute when I wasn't. I, I, I'm going to tell you some stories about how that's happened to me. Someone jamming on the drums when they thought they were muted. My kids taking out my WebEx session with my manager. Okay. Uh, spouse and kids talking. I can't, maybe you can't say what happened. I was on a video when somebody, uh, what the person I was talking to, one of his family members walked behind him wearing a towel um, in WA t-shirt, accidentally sneezed while I'm muted. Wife walking through my office, starting a conversation while a conference call, had a coughing fit, kids walking in during COVID. Yes, child crying. So, okay, so I'm, I'm going to be in good company here where I tell you some of the things that have actually happened to me. So I'm glad about that. Usually laugh things off, forgetting I was on mute, eating on camera. I was on one team and um, everybody was working together and the uh, this gentleman's young teenage daughter who was having a crisis came in and just started letting him have it and anyway their conversation was going on and he had forgotten to mute uh the ability to mute your teammates is a very very powerful thing um i've been on video conferences that didn't have that uh one conference i wasn't on but a group i was working with a very high level meeting with government officials and stuff at it and somebody fell asleep while not being muted and started snoring loudly uh, walking around the room with a hand in, oh yes, okay, so, swearing, um, okay, we got lots of, uh, lots of experiences losing internet, <laughs> okay, yes, so lots of things have happened, I, I wasn't on video, I had goats break into my office one time, they, they thought they saw another goat in their reflection in the glass door, and pushed their way in from the outside, and I had a mom and baby goat running around my office for a few minutes, cat in front of it. So the thing I love about the cats is when it's just the tail and, and you don't have the sense of perspective. And so it looks like there's a giant tentacle about to grab your coworker. That's always exciting. Okay. Well, let me tell you a story I had. Um, I was, uh, I was on a meeting and, um, fairly important meeting. I was starting working with this team. They were working with the government, a bunch of different things. Um, and we were, uh, having this meeting, going through a bunch of details of the software we were, we were going to work on. And, um, I needed to blow my nose. And so I'm there, everybody's on video, face to face, talking to each other. And I'm like, okay, I'm on mute, so that's taken care of. Um, I know what I'll do. I will just, I don't want people to see me blow my nose. So I'll just go up here, I'll put my mouse over the video button, and I'm gonna click, it'll turn the video off, I'll blow my nose, I'll turn it back on, it'll just look like a blip to people, no one will know what would happen. And 
yes, I was very much overthinking this, but I bet you have done stuff like this as, as well, right? So I've got this plan in my mind of how I'm going to do it to make it look as smooth as possible. So I do that. I go up and I click. I blow my nose loudly and then I go back to turn my video back on and I realize my mouse was not over the video button. It was over the mute button, which had previously been muted. So from my team worker, you know, from the everyone else on the call, from their perspective, Mark's there. And of course, when you make noise, it focuses on you, right? So Mark's there watching, paying attention. You guys full attention stuff. And suddenly he goes up, he comes off mute. He blows his nose loudly and then goes back on mute again. You know, blows his nose loudly, comes up as the main person talking and then goes back on, on mute again. So that was um, exciting. Uh, okay, we've got lots of, <laughs> lots of things people have had happen. Okay, so this is just part of being on online, right? Uh, another example I had of a m mistake I made is I was doing this video conferencing and um, doing one of the lunch and learns, but my video setup has the video conference setup, and then there's the thing that does my green screen and all that stuff. Well, I accidentally left the wrong camera on, and so in addition to seeing me on my slides that looks all professional and stuff, they also had a picture of me from the waist down with the green screen, a bunch of junk lying around on the floor, and me with fuzzy slippers on. And and that was up on the screen during the entire thing until somebody, at the end, somebody said, you know, I don't know exactly why we were looking at your, your feet there. So that was exciting as as well. Uh, yes, people that have worked with me, uh, tell the tractor story. I've heard it. I will tell that at the uh, at the <laughs> at the end. Um, oh, yes, the bathroom breaks while wanting to listen in. That is a scary thing. Um, I, I've heard and seen seen instances of that going horribly wrong. So so yes, uh, I I was uh, I was actually on a um, very important call one time, and suddenly this toilet flushes in the background. But I think that happened to the Supreme Court during COVID. Like they were making arguments and stuff, and somebody flushed the toilet. So anyway. So these are all things. It sounds like we're all in good uh, good company. These are things everyone has has experienced one way one way or another. Um, so let's let's go back. We want to take all, all what we're going to be talking about today. We want to go back to the agile agile principles. So let's look at a few agile principles that might influence the way that we work remotely. Business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. Okay, this might have an impact on how we choose to work when we're working remotely. Uh, build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need, and trust them to get the job done. Do your teams have decent equipment to work from home or hybrid or whatever they're being asked, asked to do? If they don't, we're not following this principle. The most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within the development team is face-to-face -face conversation. And we'll be talking about this one a lot. Agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. We can't ask or allow people to work in a way that's, that's not sustainable. Um, I've been on some teams that were, uh, the scrum master was in a different time zone. So she'd usually start early and then often stay as late as the latest time zone to work. And the team started kind of taking it on themselves to encourage her to go ahead and log off because they were trying to make sure that the team was working sustainable. Um, and that included encouraging you know, the scrum master, look, we've got the rest of this for the next two hours. You've been here from 6 a.m. our time. If you don't need to do anything, go be with your family. Go take, take the time off. Let's make sure we're being sustainable. Simplicity. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. Um, often change creates a lot more work. Uh, change needs to be, we need to try to change things in ways to make things easier and not harder. Uh, the one way I've seen this happen when people started shifting to remote work is really upping the amount of documentation that people were being asked to produce, which wasn't, sometimes there was value in that, but a lot of times it was creating a lot of complexity that didn't necessarily need to be there. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective then tunes and adjusts accordingly. Um, so with everything we're talking about today, if something isn't working, how would you know and what would you do about it? Do you have feedback mechanisms so your team will actually change stuff um, if if something's not not working? Um, and and kind of on the same point, have you tried something long enough to actually find out if it works? Right? If I try something for one day and then say, oh yeah, it just doesn't doesn't work, and I, I throw it out. Imagine a five year old going to school for the first time. Like you know, what? I I just don't like that. It's no good. We're gonna have a retrospective. And we're gonna throw school out. There's some things that you may need to invest some time in before you see the, the value of it. Okay, so all these principles we just talked about, 
why do we want to use principles for making decisions? And I would suggest that principles let you move past how you feel in the moment. So let's think of an example. Um, let's say we decide running, running is good for you, right? We want to go out and we want to, want to start running. So if I go out today, and um, now some of you, this wouldn't be a big deal, but for me, if I go out today and I just run five miles, I am going to feel awful right now. And if I let that decide whether I continue to invest in running, that, that's probably going to push me away from something that would be really, really good, really, really beneficial for me. So what I want to point out with going back to the principles is if we make sure we're making decisions based on principles, it will help us stay away from situations where we're just doing things based on how we happen to feel in the moment. It'll help us move past that to make sure we're doing things that are really going to be good for us, good for our teams long term. So let's, okay, so that's kind of background information. Now we're going to talk about how we communicate. So we're going to talk about uh, just kind of, kind of the way communication works. So what percentage of communication is nonverbal? So I'm going to throw this in the chat again here for you. The link. What percentage of communication is nonverbal? Is it 70 to 90, 50 to 70? And there's no right answer here. There's lots of different ways we could measure this. Okay, and it looks like we're like 50 to 70 percent looks like the highest one we've got right here. Like I said, there's no right answer. It depends on how you measure it, but just want to see what people kind of think or what you've heard. Okay, so most people are saying 50 to 70 percent, which is is of statistics that we've heard quite quite a bit. Um, it comes from Albert Mer Merhabian. I think I'm saying his name right. Um, which also he uh, he has a book. He's he's still alive. I'm not sure how active he is still today. But he um, he had a book I found on Amazon called The Name Game, um, and it's a list of names for your baby. It's the decision that lasts a lifetime. List of names for your baby, and then how those names are perceived on all these different. Uh, scales of different things. It points out some things like, you know, you're probably not going, we we don't have any linebackers named Percival. Um, so is that because of their name or what, what? Anyway, it's an interesting book. But when I looked this up on um, Amazon, it was kind of interesting. Uh, check out that price. Um, $877 for the paperback version of that, that game. I'm not sure why it was uh, quite so expensive there, but um. I thought that was interesting. Okay, so that was side note. Anyway, his research, he came up with, um, when some of the experiments he did, he said that 7% of communication is verbal, 38% is tone, and 55% is visual. And this is a statistic you'll hear used a lot of times. Um, the study was fairly small. It actually says that uh, this is how much information is coming from these different channels when the meaning is somewhat ambiguous. So if we just look at this right, our solution should be, we should use grunts and interpretive dance, right? Because, you know, the tone right here, we can do that with grunting. The visual is 55, we can do that with interpretive dance. And so the 7% verbal, don't worry about that. Grunts and interpretive dance can do everything we want to uh, want to do. Uh, video is getting fuzzy in clearing cycling. Okay, let me see. There's something I can do to improve that. Maybe I should stop moving around quite as much. That's how I romance my life. Wow, that's that's pretty exciting. Okay, let me see if this gets better. I'm trying to see if I've got a quick way to switch to something else. How's that looking for everybody now? Is it still looking bad? Okay, I will look. I'll try something else if we it looks like we're still having problems. Um, but what you say actually does matter. Like the words actually does matter. And Moravian's stuff was not to say that the words don't matter, but he was trying to call out how much the visual part of it plays value, particularly in deciding how well people like you. Um, that was a very, very big piece of the visual. So um, one of the examples I think from the book was if somebody says, I don't have a problem with you, just those words convey very, very little because the meaning is a little bit ambiguous, right? That could mean the exact opposite of what they're saying. Uh, it could mean lots of uh, lots of different things. And so his point was if the meaning's ambiguous, the tone and the uh, the body language is very, very important. 
There was another study here recently, um, or I think it's more recent. No, no, I guess it's more recent than Moravian, but um, still been a while. I think it's 2012. You can find this on, on H, uh, Harvard Business Review. It was the New Science of Great Teams. And they did a study um, within this office, and this particular study found that 35% of the variation in teams' performance could be accounted for simply by the number of face-to-face -face exchanges among team members. So what they did is they looked at all these teams and how they performed, and then looked at how often they ran into each other at the water cooler. So um, how often did they just have these uh, perfectly, these natural conversations just arising because they ran into each other at the water cooler or because they... Um, uh, you know, got together over lunch and those types of interactions, things not even necessarily directly about work. And it goes on to say, it may seem illogical that all those side exchanges contributed to better performance rather than distract a team, but the data prove otherwise. So what they found was the teams that were performing the most, the best, were the ones that were actually having more distractions of just interacting with each other. Now, you can find the study and it was specific situation stuff. It doesn't mean that your goal should be just to try to distract your team. But I think there is a core key element here that those side exchanges that seemed like they weren't necessarily related fostered a bunch of um, collaboration that let the teams work more effectively. So that brings us to the idea of video conferencing, right? Um, if everybody's working home, obviously this is what we need to do, right? If we want to have just these face-to-face -face communication, lots of it is a visual channel, and we want to have kind of side conversations going on and these side exchanges, video conferencing is, is the way to do this, right? Um, because research says a large portion of communication is visual. Agile says the most efficient and effective way to communicate is to face-to-face. -face. Therefore, what we need to do is schedule video meetings all the time. This is obviously what we need to do, right? Um, if you experience the lockdown from COVID, you may have actually experienced something like, like this, right? So is, is this the solution? Um, it doesn't necessarily follow that that's the solution, but let's, let's run with it for just a minute. Let's pretend that that's the solution is having lots of, of video, scheduling video meetings. Um, I remember when COVID started, trying to get a hold of anyone became very, very difficult because they were just booked with video meetings the, in, the entire time. Um, so I'm not, we're just going to suspend uh, the, I, the logic issue with this for a minute and pretend that this does make sense and then talk about what the objections might be. Okay, one thing would be online meetings are exhausting. That's one thing I've heard people say, and that's that's a you know legitimate example to why we don't want to have online meetings to try to replicate face-to-face -face communication that we have in an organization. But let's challenge that and let's say, is that actually a good reason? If something is more effective, might it wear you out more? So here's here's an example right here. Okay, so any of these four positions right here are going to be exhausting, right? If I'm hanging out in any of these four positions and, and actually using the machine, those are going to be exhausting. This over here is not exhausting, right? That's the position that's not exhausting. And the point I want to make is just whether or not something tires you out probably isn't a very good indication of whether it's a good thing or not. Online meetings are exhausting, but so are in-person meetings, right? There's lots of in-person meetings are exhausting too. So obviously we can make them less exhausting by cutting out 55% of the communication. Here's what that would look like, right? We can remove 55% of the data we have to process in meetings according to the stats we saw earlier um, by just putting paper bags over our heads. Then, then we can meet all day and only be a half as, as tired. Okay, so I'm obviously joking here. But let's go back and look at Agile. When we're in person, how have Agile teams avoided the inefficiencies of all-day meetings? Agile isn't set up to try to maximize the amount of meetings we have. It's actually designed to try to minimize the amount of meetings we have. So how do Agile, how have Agile teams avoided the inefficiency of all-day meetings? I'm not trying to say that scheduling of video meetings are ideal, but tiredness is not a good way to determine effectiveness. We should expect highly effective and efficient work to wear you out, but in a good way. So here's, um, I don't know if you guys have seen these adult tricycles, basically. And uh, when I was a kid, my grandma had decided that she had a friend that had a, uh, she lived in a little tiny town uh, where my dad had grown up. Maybe, I don't know, maybe a hundred people lived there or something like that. And her a friend had a tricycle, something like this, that she'd ride to the uh, post office and different things around town. And my grandma decided, well, I, I think I'd like to try that too. So she got herself a tricycle like this. 
tried it a few times and it wasn't for her. So it eventually made its way to the farm where I was. And um, us kids found this was a wonderful thing. Uh, we would take this bicycle and we would, one of us would be sitting on the seat riding it, another one in the back in the basket, another one standing or fit somehow, I'm not sure exactly how we did it, but we got them on the handlebars, and another one sitting kind of underneath it, hanging onto the basket, sitting on a skateboard. And we would go, there was an old military road that was, was paved, and we would go down that road, go on adventures, and had a wonderful time with this, this bike. At the end of the day of doing that, we were exhausted, but it was not a bad type of tire, right? It was the best type of tire that you could ever experience. Um, this is how it should feel in working with an agile team that's being effective efficient and effective. People want to go to a project like that, not because it's easy and not because they're not tired at all, but because it's the good type of tire, the type of tire that actually energizes you instead of draining you and makes you want to get up in the morning and, and join. So question for you, what activity at your job makes you feel the good type of tired? I'm curious to see what people think of that. I will add a link here again. Leaving work is the good type of tired, okay? Making project on a project, making progress on a project or task. PI planning. PI planning can be a very invigorating, particularly when you're able to get stuff done. Working hard problem, finding the answer. Brainstorming new solutions to hard problems. Finishing something. Teaching others. Meaningful conversations. Requirements, okay? A big lunch. Okay, a good type of tire. <laughs> I haven't eaten lunch yet, so you're making me hungry. Happy customers. Yes, when you give customers something and say, yes, this makes my life better. That's awesome. Somebody uh, said uh, stand-ups. A uh, busy day when you've helped your team. Conducting training. Okay, cool. So these are, we've experienced this good type of, of tired, right? And what I, just what I want to point out is a lot of what I see is the resistance to online meetings is when it's the bad type of tired, like you're exhausting, you don't feel, you're not feeling any of this at the end of it. So a couple things that I see as being a really good type of tired are mob programming all day and making great progress with a new technology. So that's a good type of tired. Um, three tips trips to the Department of Motor Vehicles because they keep telling you to bring different documents, that is a bad type of tired, right? I'm exhausted in both of those cases, but this feels awful, even if I'm less tired than the other thing of the mob programming. Um, an intense day of working directly with the customer to demo software and getting feedback where you're getting lots of information there, you're getting their feedback, they're hearing from you and you're working through how to best develop stuff. Um, good type of tired. So are all day meetings the good type of tired? Probably not, or in a lot of cases not, um, which is why, and definitely not if you're doing it every single day. And this is why Agile meetings, or Agile in meetings, if you look at Agile, it's really focused on trying to minimize the number of meetings. So what happened when everyone started working from home? Well, we scheduled face-to-face -face meetings um, for communication, right? Um, it's not sustainable. It wasn't simple. Like I said, I couldn't find time with people for the next six weeks because they were scheduled in all these meetings. But this is the opposite of what Agile achieves in person. I think this is really key, right? What we, by replacing the collaboration that was happening in Agile with online scheduled meetings, we kind of did the opposite of what Agile achieves in person. More meetings is not the way to better follow Agile principles. In fact, it runs, runs counter to it. So should we just skip the whole face-to-face -face thing? Well, of course not. But meetings probably are not the answer. And that brings us to team rooms. So this is how Agile has, has saw it. So in, we're going to jump back over and think of how things work in person. In person, a lot of the way that we've gotten rid of the meetings that normally would be required and say, okay, we'll meet about that next week or whatever, is we create team rooms where communication can happen really naturally. So in team rooms, we have instant face-to-face -face communication, right? If I'm in the same room with you, I can look over the my desk and holler at you and talk to you. You can jump in and out of conversations. If I'm over here working with, with someone and like we get to the point and I don't need to be part of the conversation anymore, but it's continuing on, I can go somewhere else, right? I can jump in and out very, very easily. It's very easy to tell if somebody's busy or not. I can look over and see, hey, Bob looks head down over there doing this programming thing. Oh, Sue over there is playing solitaire. I bet there's not going to be a problem if I go over and talk to Sue. 
um, much information is communicated by overhearing it. If you've been in a team room, I'm sure you've experienced where you've been there talking to, or you've been working on something and you hear kind of out of the corner of your ear, somebody talking about something that you dealt with yesterday. And they're talking about how they're going to try to do something. Hey, wait a minute. I had that experience yesterday. Here's how we fixed it. Uh, let me, let me show you how we did that because it took me about a good hour and I can save you that, that time. Um, and there's no overhead of scheduling a meeting room, right? It's not like, okay, we're going to find a meeting room and maybe in the next three weeks we can sit down and have a conversation about this. No, you're just, you're right there. You just have the conversation and visual communication is happening naturally. Um, you're looking at each other. If you're having a communication and you know, somebody's not comfortable with something, it's really easy to see it because you're right there talking to them versus if it's happening over email or something like that. Okay, so team rooms, right? Thumbs up. Those are those are great. Well, how could we create virtual team rooms? What would that look like? What would teams look like if we were trying to duplicate what team rooms were giving us in on person and get, try to get some of those advantages, but doing it virtually? So virtual team rooms, can we get things like, so, so if we're thinking of virtual team rooms, what's the technology that could give us instant face-to-face -face communication, jumping in and out of conversation, easy to tell if someone is busy or not, information being communicated easily by overhearing it, no overhead of scheduling a meeting room and visual communication happening naturally. Well, here's, here's a list, right? We've got some of these things. We've got, we could do an email list or we could do an online forum or an SMS group text or chat software, or phone bridge or, or video room. Well, if these are our goals over here, email list. Well, that's not gonna be instant face-to-face -face communication. Uh, sometimes there are ways to jump in and out of conversations by subscribing to us currently. It's not really easy to tell if somebody's busy or not. It's nice because it's asynchronous, right? That's, that's advantageous. Um, much information communicated by overhearing it. Not really, it, um, you probably had the experience of not being on an important email list that people put lots of work into and you had the one piece of information that would have saved them a lot of time. Uh, no overhead of scheduling a meeting. That's true with email. Uh, visual communication happening naturally. No. Well, if we go through all these things and try to think about the stuff that we're trying to replicate from a team room, um, all of these things hit different pieces of this, right? An online forum. There's some really big advantages of that. Uh, SMS group text. It's mobile where people have access to it. That's nice. Uh, chat software. That's really good. You can kind of tune it out and then come back and see where you pick, pick up. Phone bridge might do some of these things, right? You're, you're at least real time with people. Uh, but the video room is actually the one that actually catches most of this. And now notice when I say a vigil, video team room, I'm not saying a meet scheduled meeting. So think about a video team room. If we're in a physical room and it's time for a daily face-to-face -face meeting, um, you just stand up and have the meeting, right? And if you're using a video team room as an actual virtual team room and not as a meeting, you can actually recreate, recreate this type of experience of it just being the place where people hang out and, and work together. So um, in a virtual team room, you need to ask Bob a question. Well, you look at Bob and see if Bob's busy. Oh, it looks like he's busy or it looks like he's not online. Okay, I'll get to him later or I'll send him a chat message. Um, Sue and Alice are talking about something that you're interested in. Well, you just tune in and listen to it, right? Uh, just like you would in a, in a, in a, in a physical team room. Uh, security needs to ask your team some questions. Well, if you're physically in a building, probably what you do is say, hey, come on down to our team room. We'll have everybody there. We can talk through, through this. Um, that's the type of thing that you can do with a virtual room if you want to do that. Let's check a couple questions here. Yes, the, and Sean, the thing you're talking about, about just kind of hanging out together, I think is very, very helpful. Uh, I have seen people do this with, with voice, um, where they're just on kind of a conference bridge working together, and some teams have found that works very, very well for them. The most effective ones I've seen actually get to the point where the video is, is, is comfortable. Uh, another example, Alice is going to spend 30 minutes explaining some new technology. Well, we could schedule a meeting three weeks later to try to do that. But if, we're, if we've got the same concept of a physical collaborative workspace, it's probably just a matter of saying, okay, after stand-up, anyone that, or after our daily face-to-face 30-minute meeting stand-up or 15-minute meeting stand-up, um, Alice is going to go through this new technology. So everybody stick around that wants to talk about this. She'll show you. If you work on something else, that's fine. You can just kind of listen in. If it needs 100% of your attention, you can do that. Um, other thing, your kid just walked into the room with their faces covered in red and green markers, right? This is an experience you might not have at work, but these are the types of things that on a, in a virtual team room, you're probably going to experience. Um, 
the people that I have worked with where we've all been remote, I know their kids a lot better than the people I've worked with physically in the office. So you can use all kinds of other technology, but with a video team room, face-to-face -face becomes the de default. It uh, becomes the primary. It's the way that things happen as a first choice, and then you can back off to something else, move to something else if, if you need to. Now, some of the objections uh, I've heard to virtual team rooms are, I don't want people looking at me. I, and, and I do get this. The first time I worked with a team that was saying, hey, this is how we want you to work, it freaked me out. So I completely get, the, get how, how this feels. But then I got to thinking and I realized when I'm in at work, uh, people are looking at me all the time, right? I'm not going around like this trying, trying to hide stuff. So as long as I can set up an environment where I'm okay with it being my work environment, like maybe not pointing it at the rest of the, the household, um, I can probably, for me, when I was thinking through this, it was like, okay, well, I can get used to that because it is just like I'm at work. It's just they've got my space on my bookshelves behind me instead. Another argument I've heard against this that I, I found interesting is people were complaining that it's not asynchronous. Um, and you may have seen a chart that looks something like this. So this was from uh, Matt uh, Mullenweg, who did the uh, the WordPress software. Um if five distributed workers, five levels of autonomy and at automatic, which is the name of the company that produces uh, WordPress, they're striving to get to this autonomous way, way of working. That's, that's one of their, their goals. They have people in lots of time zones, excuse me, all the way around the world. So this is something that they're uh, just striving for. Uh, they're modeling this after self driving cars and how they, they're progressing toward being autonomous. So that's, that's an interesting idea. But asynchronous isn't a solution necessarily, at least in my mind, to distributed work. Asynchronous is an effort to let people work autonomously. Um, autonomous asynchronous work can be a good goal, but it doesn't describe all kinds of work. And particularly if we think of what Agile, for, a Agile is for, Agile is for collaborative work. It's a way of being able to try to work to, to, together. Um, and if we're trying to achieve the efficiencies of collaboration, we need to make sure that we're not focusing on being autonomous when what we really need to be efficient is, is collaboration. So there's some overlap, but these are headed in very, very different directions, at least on a personal level, on, on how I interact with other people within the team. So Agile creates individuals collaborating in teams with some degree of autonomy. So the teams have the autonomy, to work together as a team, but the individuals are working in a highly collaborative, uh, a highly collaborative way, which is almost the opposite of trying to let the individuals work in an autonomous way. Let me check the comments right here. In a real workspace, conversation happening three cubes down can be ignored. With a video team room, it's like having everyone in your cube all the time talking. So I think that's a very, very good point. Um, what I found is there's a size that works. If you're working with a team of maybe four or five people developing together, I found that works fine. Even even higher, maybe like eight people, it works okay. Um, the other thing I've seen that works well is if I am in a really, really busy room and I'm having a conversation uh, in, in physical stuff, I've heard people say, hey, can you guys take that over to a breakout room because we're trying to talk about something here or focus on so something else. Same thing happens with virtual team rooms. If you've got other rooms, you can jump to and say, hey, we're going over here to talk about this. We know not everybody's interested in it, but we're going to be over in you know, this, this other, other room. Uh, but you're right. There is a little bit of a, um, it, it is different because you don't have the, uh, the space where you're walking towards someone and, and away from them. What I've seen some people do too, is they can kind of tune it down. Like they turn their volume, if they're working on something else, they want to be able to kind of hear it in the background, turn it down. They can hear it if somebody hears their name, but it's more of a background noise for them. And that doesn't always work for everyone, but that's, um, one thing I've seen. Uh, Major differences is you can see yourself on the screen and it makes people self-conscious. I ask people the reluctant to turn on the camera to ignore, turn off the self-view. I like the self-view, but some of that comes from the fact I was once on a TV with mud streaked over my face playing the piano and no one else told me about that until I went off later. So I kind of like to know what I look like. But yes, I definitely get the get that. Um, the other thing I found that's, at least for me, is if I have a separate monitor that people are on and I'm looking at and it's got my video conferencing on it, that's a lot more comfortable to me because it's a window into my team room. 
if they're behind the stuff I'm working on and I have to bring them up and take them down, bring them up and take them down, that's a little bit more weird because then I'm not, it's not like I'm looking into people's eyes. It's like they're behind something and I can't see and it's more like a one-way mirror or a two-way mirror. Um, so I usually try to make sure I've got a separate monitor or even a completely separate device. Anyway, uh, this thing, Agile creates individuals collaborating in teams with some degree of autonomy. So the teams are autonomous in what they're able to deliver or, or more so, but the individuals are not that they can't do anything on their own, but the way that you're getting value from them is intense collaboration. Yes, put it back over your head. I'm gonna have to try that sometime in a personal meeting, just see if, or in an in-person meeting and just see if people think it's odd, you know. Uh, individuals are collaborative, Individuals are collaborative within teams that have autonomy. So that was the point. I guess I kind of du duplicated that. Individuals are collaborative within teams that have autonomy. And this is what we're trying to achieve with, with Agile. So if we think of hybrid work, um, hybrid work has some challenges, right? When everyone's virtual, everyone's on the same footing. But once you have two people co-located, you have to be very, very careful because you can end up with a conversation happening here that no one else is, is part of. Um, I've worked on teams where we had, let's see, was it three, four team rooms around the country, and then probably about five people remote, working remotely at, at any time. If the team rooms left their audio off, it was really hard because whatever team room had the people that happened to know about a particular thing in it, um, everybody else mi missed out if they happened to mute. So we tried to strive for if you're in the team room, you, you'd leave it, um, leave your audio on so people could overhear conversations. Now, there were, there were obviously exceptions to that, but that was one of the ways they tried to make sure that we didn't have situations where the co-located people had great communication and everybody else was left out. Uh, yeah, the, I, I like the, the comment about the, um, the eyes fixed. That's why I like... I like having a big monitor for, for my team room so I can see people well and also, well, and I like to see what, what I'm, how I'm showing up to them too. Um, but that being something that's separate, even a completely different device than the computer I'm working on. Uh, giving people a window into their team room. This is what I was, I was just talking about, about having this other device, other monitor at least, um, that's looking into the team room where all their, their teammates are. There's also, um, in hybrid work, one of the challenges is the cultural message messages, right? If being in the office is seen as being better, um, you you may end up with some type of hierarchy. I think a lot of businesses are really trying to figure out how to deal with this right now. So uh, thinking about other co technologies, so some of the other things that we we looked at are, are all can be very, very good tools, right? Um, I encourage teams to try to take a video first approach because that best seems to align with the agile principles. And when you've got teams that are comfortable doing that, um, once you get over to the point that everybody's comfortable with it, what I usually see emerge is people are like, hey, I'm going to go heads down for an hour. I need to work on something. Ping me on chat if, um, if, if I'm not, not, if you need me for something, then I'll, I'll jump back on. And you get this really good, highly collaborative, but people finding ways if, if they need a little bit more space for something, it can happens very naturally. Um, persistent group chat. This has been one of the biggest things that I've seen, and I, this is fairly common now. A few years ago, some systems were hard to set up like this, um, but where there's a chat that's still there, even if you don't happen to, depend to be online, so you can go back through and scroll through and see what you missed when you're out to lunch, uh, which is great if you're on different, um, have people in different time zones. Uh, persistent chat uh, is shared area, not hundreds of channels. Uh, if you have hundreds of channels, it becomes you end up trying to dig through to find where things were. Searchable is a big deal. Accessible from personal mobile devices. Uh, not every place can do this, but the places I've seen that the teams are most collaborative, um, they've got it to where they can they can jump in and review the messages, even if they're kind of away from their desk, desk or something. Uh, the place I've seen some teams <laughs> or get to the point where they're, I mean, their friends were the people on the team. So one guy was on vacation and he sends back a vacation picture and then a little bit later shows his car, which is wrecked because he had hit a turkey or something like that. But his friends were on the team. Those were the people that he was wanting to share stuff. He wasn't working during his vacation, but that was just the people that he was chatting with. Uh, easy to post pictures and links. Doesn't invisibly mangle code. I've seen that happen a lot. Hooks from the build server so you can send notifications to it and being able to tag people if you need to say, hey, I need to make sure Joe sees this or something. Uh, Wiki is another good tool. I'm going to jump through this. Um, another big thing for uh, for remote work is making sure you're investing in good audio. Uh, my setup, I've got it quiet enough and good speakers and microphones, so I'm not usually using a headset. 
Um, but this is something well worth investing in for people so they can actually tune out other, other stuff around them. Um, and it's a lot more comfortable if you know that you're sending just your mic and you can mute things easily um, instead of it being something where it's like you're, you've got any audio from your house. Your dog starts barking, you can just hit, hit mute on it. Um, some of the things, I think we talked about a lot of this from video team rooms. Uh, blurring backgrounds. I know that's something very common now. It used to be something that was harder to get, so that's been great. Another great thing I've seen with uh, video team rooms is if you have a telephone call-in number. Um, I remember I was going to San Francisco. The team I was working with was there, and I couldn't get in the building. Um, so I called in the telephone number, and so on this video virtual team room, I'm like, hey, I'm down in the lobby. Can someone come down and, and get me? Um, and it was used like that often when somebody just needed to get in and talk to the people, talk to the people in their in their team room. Um, okay, I'm going to rush through this because I have we're going to do some stuff at the end here. Uh, some of these things when I did this when I first wrote some of these things down these were harder to do than uh than now. Uh, adjustable zoom that's one thing that I found somebody mentioned not being able to see people's eyes but if you've got a system that lets people really kind of say here's the frame I want to want to present. Oh, and this was another one. Having separate, and I know this can't be done all the time, but I found for me it's been very, very useful. I've got separate hardware for the video team room that I'm in. If I need to reboot my, particularly if I'm working on something that needs to reboot the system occasionally, that keeps it separate. So I can keep having conversations even if I need to reboot my laptop, which is very similar to what um, I would be doing if I was in a physical team room. Uh, that, that's been useful to, very useful to me even if the other hardware is just a cheap computer that I've set up and used for uh, video conferencing. Um, foreign software, forum software, another way. Forum software can be useful. I find most of the time, if you've got the ability to search chat, it might be better to have fewer places to look than, than more. Um, but sometimes that can be a, a useful thing. What, with all these tools we're looking at, what I have found to be kind of an anti-pattern is trying to do all of them. We've got a wiki, we've got forum software, we've got our personal chat, we've got a shared drive, and we've got all these things. Personally, what I found is if you start with saying, okay, we're going to focus on video team rooms, and then we're going to have persistent chat, and then we'll grow into other things as we need them, that's usually better than trying to start with everything and then getting to the point that uh, you, you never know where to look for stuff because everything's spread over five or six different systems. Um, let's see. See some comments. Yes, to headsets, norms, working agreements. We generally tell folks, if you're talking, you're on camera. If not, you're on mute. Use the raise hand feature for decorum. Not everyone wants to, but Mark's point, what if you were in the office? Um, I think it depends on the size. If you've got four people, you want them to develop the ability to interrupt each other respectfully. So you've got four or eight people, maybe even 12 people, something like that. It kind of changes the bigger, the bigger it gets. But what you don't, if I'm in the office talking to people, it's easier for me to, um, to kind of interject into a conversation than, than if I'm online. If it's smaller number of people online, there, there are ways to do that. But if the videos are being, if the video is being used well and, and you've actually got a good setup, I've been in lots of situations where somebody will be talking and then say, Mark looks like he's got something he wants to come. I didn't raise my hand or anything. They're just looking at my face and realizing I've got, I'm thinking through this and want, want to say something. That's when I think you're really starting to see that you've got the right setup is when you're having conversations and people are reading your face to try to say, hey, let's let this person say something. Or I'm going through this, I'm looking over here and... Sally looks like she's not really on board with this. Let's let's hear her concerns. So that's where it really starts working. Working. That, that's that's an indication I think that you've really started to recreate what you'd have if you were in person. Let's see. Cool. Okay. Uh, whiteboard tools. Just a few comments on these. Uh, these are really only useful if you have decent drawing tools, and a uh, a trackpad is not a drawing tool. I've seen teams that invested heavily in this, but then they had some people trying to draw on the, the trackpad and they ended up just not using it, like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of investment in, in stuff that was really, really cool, but without the remote people actually having access to it, it became more, more one-sided. Um, it also can be hard to search for later. I found that a lot of times if you've got real-time shared document editing, like a like Google Docs type thing where everybody can type at the same time, uh, 
the value of being able to do that and search for it later sometimes is even better than the whiteboard tools. Now, Miro and some things like that uh, give you some other ways to approach things. Uh, these can be really, really useful. Um, once again, whatever lets you collaborate the most with people is probably going to be most valuable. Okay, I'm going to skip through a little bit of this. Okay, agile culture. Ultimately, it comes down to whether or not you have a culture that prioritizes the agile principles. So somebody had asked about this story earlier. Um, I was on a fairly important call and we were getting ready to break for lunch. So broke for lunch. Um, I was doing something and I heard somebody talking on it and I had a, I turned off the, um, so I turned, I turned my volume down and had to take a telephone call and stuff. Come back when we're supposed to be back from lunch and uh, no one's, no one's saying anything. Like, I was like, okay, we're going to start at 1230. And right as we had left, somebody had talked about a John Deere video that they had, they had shown. So I'd watched it over lunch. Um, no one's talking, but I could see, and these people didn't have video on. Um, I could see some things coming up, like, uh, as if somebody was like maybe making noise at their desk or something. And I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll help kick things off. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and give, give, kind of get people kicked off here. So I'll start the conversation. So I came off and I said, hey, I watched that tractor video. And um, it, it was interesting, but it's, since I live in a, a rural area, it seems to kind of leave out that a lot of what John Deere is doing in this area, there's a lot of concern by farmers about the DRM that's being put on tractors so they can't fix their tractors. And um, so I heard somebody say something and I realized my volume was down. So I turned my volume, volume up and they said, oh, well, that's interesting. And I said, yeah, it's kind of a uh, weird because the older tractors are selling for more sometimes than the newer tractors because farms get, and I'm going off about this. And then finally, uh, one of my coworkers was like, uh, does this have something to do with our, our meeting? And, and what had happened was, is I had turned my volume down when I left for, for lunch because there was some audio coming, coming through it and um, forgot to turn it back on. They were full swing into the meeting. And Mark comes on and starts talking about tractors. And uh, since I have a reputation for like talking about something to try to bring it to, to relate to something, they let me go on far too long before somebody somebody asked about it. Um, so I still uh, I'm still teased about this to this day about like you know Mark and and the, and the tractors. Uh, but what was interesting is it was some of these people I had worked with for for a long time, and they were kind of covering for me or trying to cover for me a little bit in the chat I saw later. And one of them made the comment that previously, and I'd forgotten about this, but we had been on a, another important call on another project and um, he was, he was getting zoned out. Like it was, it was hard for him to pay attention. So he like had some rap music he, he really liked and he turned it on full volume and, and started playing it to kind of wake himself up, but he had forgotten to mute. So it starts making all this, depending on your view, but coming through, it sounded like, like, no, depending on your view of rap, but coming through the thing, it sounded like lots of noise, but it was music. It has like, Hey, um, I think your dogs are, are barking. You may want to mute or something like that. And he was making the comment that like, yeah, back when this happened to me, Mark had my back. So I was trying to cover on this. But point is that if you're working online like this, you're going to have to develop a culture of trying to look at looking out for, for each other, um, being able to mute each other when they need it and stuff, stuff like that. And you can create a culture around it of your friends and you're all trying to work together the best, best you can. So back to the agile principles, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. The most efficient, effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face. -face. Build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. And agile, promise, agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. If you're looking at these principles and trying to say, how can we best follow these principles in our situation, you'll find what works right for you. Um, it may not be the first thing that people are most comfortable with, but if you're driving by the principles, you'll get past just, is this uncomfortable, to say, is this actually better for, for our team? So that covers um, that covers what I wanted to, to touch on today. Uh, now, we're going to give away something. This was last team I was working with that we were trying to promote uh, video team rooms. My kids and I printed up all these shirts, right? So we've got all these t-shirts encouraging people to say, we value face-to-face -face communication, turn your video on. Encouraging people to, pro to participate visually in, in our conversations. Anyway, I have some of these t-shirts. I'm going to give one away uh, to the winner of our competitive quiz here. And this is just for fun. I know some of the timing might be off and stuff like that. It's just for fun. We could flip coins to see who wins it and it probably would be just about accurate. So, um, so that said, okay. Oh, let me make sure everybody's got the link because you're obviously going to want to participate. 
because these t-shirts are like, you know, one of a kind designer t-shirts here. Let me see, I'll have it over here too. Okay, so let's get started. Everybody said, supply just the image. Uh, send me an email. I will. I can. I can send you the image of it. Somebody was making one with their cricket. I think. Um, how does in-person agile cut down exhausting meetings while still collaborating? So if if we think back, how we act when we're in person, how does it handle cutting down exhausting meetings? Does it do it by putting paper bags over our heads? By using team rooms? By using two-hour workdays? Love those. Unlimited monster drinks or brighter lights. How does in-person Agile cut down exhausting meetings while still collaborating? Not a tractor as a prize. Yes, I, that is a good idea. Actually, I should have. I've got some other t-shirts for my shed family farm. For the farm, my, my parents' farm. And there's no tractor. There is a, a, uh, a barn on it, I guess. Okay. So, answer yes, team rooms. Agile cuts down on exhausting meetings while still collaborating by switching to team rooms rather than trying to schedule meetings. Here's our leaderboard. And uh, if we have too many people winning, if everybody gets it right, I'll have to do something random, but I can give away a few shirts, I think. I'm not sure how many I've got. In Moravian's experiments, what were the communication percentages? Was it 38% smell, 55 verbal, 38 visual, 7% verbal, 55 tone, 38 visual, 55 grunting, 7% verbal, and 38 aural, 38 tone, 7% verbal, and 55% visual. What were the percentages in the experiment? I know this is very specific information, but yes, it was 38% tone, 7% verbal, 55 visual, um, which was very, very close to this, this one up here. Yeah, we, this one swapped the visual in. So, very good on that, and and yes, the grunting. I like that we've got nine percent saying it was grunting and verbal, um, but but that as isn't what he measured. I think that would be a great experiment to uh, to do though. Tim Allen disagrees. Fifty percent. <laughs> okay, very good. We got three people in the top spot now, but that can change quickly. In the Harvard Business Review article, "New Science of Great Teams," what accounted for thirty-five percent of a team's performance? Was it team cohesion, grunts and interpretive dance, side exchanges, or team skill sets? Now, some of these things can be very good, but specifically from the quote I showed from the article. Remember, they were, they were looking at teams and saying the teams that were performing better, there was something that they were doing that they could tie 35% of their performance to. And it was... The side exchanges. I knew that. I knew I tripped some people up with this. So it was the the side exchanges, which probably could be a good related to team cohesion. But the specific thing they were falling, calling out is that when the teams had interactions at the water cooler or, or break or just running in past each other in the hall and talking to each other, and I think they actually had badges so they could tell when people like met in passing and and talked. Uh, they would like read read off each other. They found that 35% of the performance of the teams was tied to how many of these side exchanges happened. And it was counterintuitive because they were expecting, and if I remember right, this wasn't even a highly collaborative task. I'll have to look at the article. Um, but it was something that you wouldn't expect this to make as big a difference on, on the performance. But just having those conversations, those things back and forth, and this is, this is one of the things that when I've seen teams that have really, really worked well together, um, they're using video team rooms. One of the signs is when, uh, of saying, hey, this team is really starting to get it, is when they start commenting on each other's weather. Like, hey, I see out your window, it looks like you've got a storm coming. Are you okay? Do you need to go to the basement or something like that? When they're having those types of conversations, so it's not just about work, but they're coming the same way they would if they were in person. Okay, our leaderboard here. Okay, we've still got three people in the top spot. Very good. Why did Mark say we should use principles? Was it to move past how you feel? Was it to be agile? Was it to be certified in Scrum, to develop software, or to make meetings faster? Remember, these all may be good things, but there was one specific thing I want, called out at the beginning be about why we should use principles to make decisions. Two seconds left. To move past how you feel. Yes, we want to follow... At, 
following the agile principles will help us to be, be agile. But the specific thing I was calling out earlier here was that if we make decisions just based on how we feel, we may not get far enough to actually start getting the benefits from it. I was talking about like if, if I'm running um, based on how I feel the very first day, I, I'll probably just get, give it up. Um, but if I'm understanding the principles, it will help me make sure that I'm doing things that are good for me beyond just how I, how I feel. Okay, leaderboard. I think I've got two more questions here. Very good. Okay, we've got Darren in the top spot. What is next week's Lunch and Learn? We showed this at the very beginning. Is it Agile at a Distance, Effective Remote, and Hybrid Teams? Give you a clue. Well, no, I won't give you a clue. Retrospectives at work. What is behavior-driven development? Using chat GPT to create user stories? Or the curse of the testing pyramid? And time's up. Yes, it is Retrospectives at Work with Phil Ledgerwood. Um, I think this is going to be very, very interesting. I know I'm looking forward to it. I would encourage you to take the invite you have and email it to, you know, just forward on. You can forward it on to people. It's fine to do that either, not just in your organization, but any uh, coworkers, colleagues you have elsewhere. Um, this should be very, very interesting. Um, so I'd encourage you to get that out there for anybody that might benefit from being able to really make their retrospectives work, which probably is most teams that are doing Agile. Okay, our leaderboard. Oh, we've got drones in the top space now. In Agile, individuals are blank within teams that have blank. So in Agile, individuals are autonomous within teams that have collaboration. They're happiest within teams that have autonomy, or they're autonomous in the teams that have product that have productive, should be productivity, or collaborative within teams that have autonomy. And this came to when we were talking about distributed work. And Yes, it was collaborative within, individuals are collaborative within teams that have autonomy. And the point of that was if we get really focused on how to make people work autonomously, we'll miss out on a lot of what Agile is designed to do, which is get efficiencies from collaboration. And I think that's the end. And okay, Lucas pulls in the top spot. So very good, Lucas, send me your... Um, take a screenshot, send it to me. As a matter of fact, let's see what we've got here. I'll tell you what, let's give, we will give t-shirts away. I was thinking we'd have probably three winners. So Lucas, Drawns, and Darren, send me a screenshot, uh, just an email and your uh, mailing address, and I will get you your very own We Value Face-to-Face -face Communication shirts sent, sent your way. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to stick around for a few minutes if anybody has any uh, comments or thoughts they want to, to talk about. Um, and hope to see you next week when we're going to be talking about retrospective. So please pass that on to anyone that you think might be interested. Thanks, Mark. Any thoughts, concerns, aggravations? I think I need to do something about the video quality. Oh. I forgot, there's one more thing here. If you're still there, uh, if you can get feedback on what you thought of this, I would really appreciate it. Uh, talk about ways to, okay, somebody was asking about ways to um, to encourage team turn turn on camera. So that's a, uh, that's a good question um, and it can be very challenging. I would suggest that one thing, like doing the t-shirts was one fun thing that, that we, we did to try to encourage people to do that. Um, you may need to have conversations with people to get them on board with why you're trying to do it, to try to establish it as a norm. It's a lot harder to do in a team that's already formed than if you're forming a new team. Um, I've been on teams that are like, we're forming a new team, this is how we're going to work. And so part of when they were interviewing people was like, are you okay with working th this way? Is this something that you're at least willing to, to try to work with? Um, I think a lot of it too can be leading by example, make sure you've got enough people leading by example, uh, making it fun, um, and at least starting with it in places where, where you, you can. So I, it, it, it is a challenging thing, but I think a lot of it is if you come back and say, why are we doing this? And are, do we have a team that's really trying to follow the agile principles or are we trying to do something else? So that's, um, that, that's one place I would suggest starting. Uh, what are the best ways to increase team autonomy? 
Um, okay, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that I've seen that's problematic in a lot of places, and that's a uh, scaled agile framework. It's not because scaled agile framework necessarily makes things worse for team autonomy, but when when organizations start trying to implement scaled agile framework, they seem to oftentimes get very focused on the fact that they're going to be able to coordinate work between teams. And if you see that you've now got a tool to coordinate work between teams, you may be less likely to try to remove the need to coordinate work between teams. Um, so, so that's where I, I, one thing I've seen where a lot of people are coming in and trying to make teams to where, um, or trying to assume that we're, we can be really, really good at coordinating between teams. Scaled Agile Framework is designed to do the coordination that there's no way to break otherwise. So ways to try to give teams a little bit more autonomy. One thing I've seen effective is actually getting a Kanban board out that shows where your work is and start adding columns where you've got stuff that you know you're going to have to wait for something. Um, and really get, get a tool or do it on paper or whatever that really shows how much your wait time is for those places you don't have autonomy and you're waiting on people in other teams. And then really start focusing in on how to make those pieces better. For example, I was working with a, a group, a government project, and there had to be a security sign-off on everything before it went live. And normally what would happen is that would go through, as a matter of fact, security sign-off before they started working on it, another one before they actually deployed it uh, somewhere else. And um, those things would take like two weeks wait sometimes on both, both ends of it. So what we did is we finally talked to the people that were involved in the security and said, hey, instead of this thing where we give you something and you have to spend two weeks trying to figure out what we're doing, if you can join our daily stand-up or daily face-to-face -face meeting, you'll have all the context you need um, to approve it just, just right there. So we did that and it worked out great for the people in the security because they were now spending 15 minutes a day and doing something that was really valuable instead of spending lots of time with us waiting on them doing a much worse job because they didn't have the context of things as we were discussing them. So that's that's one way, but Kanban can give you a lot of insight. I mean, you can do it with Scrum, a Scrum board too, but just trying to find out where your dependencies are and then trying to make a case for why you should try to lower those by either bringing resources into the team or having people as part of your face-to-face -face meeting or whatever that looks like. There's a talk, and if you go to the Agile Lunch and Learn YouTube page, I think I've got it there about um, the cost of delay. So really looking at the cost of delay is a great way to try to start having conversations around that. So I'd look into that. Any other thoughts, concerns, questions? Yeah, great, great question on that. Okay, well, I'm going to sign off. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can always reply to anything you get from me with an email if there's other questions or if you've got ideas for future lunch and learn. Or if there's something you're interested in, if we can uh, get together and do some more customized stuff for you for your company. But have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone.